want you to turn in your Bible to the book of Isaiah chapter 51. Isaiah chapter 51. I got saved in this church a number of years back, and um, I can remember when I got saved, we were at the uh, a Circle Ballroom, and uh, I responded to the, uh, uh, to the invitation. It was during a revival with Warren Johnson, uh, and I remember coming forward. You know how you sit in your seat, and they, they say, raise your hand, you raise your hand, and then they say, get up and come forward, and that changes everything. And so I remember just, I didn't want to come forward. I was right in the middle of a row. I mean, there's like 10 people this way, 10 people that way. And, uh, and so I, I made up in my mind, I ain't going forward, man. Not in front of all these people. And then the evangelist goes, you young man right there. And he, he describes what I have on. And you know what we do. We look around like, hey. He goes, why don't you lead everyone up? And so I remember, man. Excuse me, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me. <laughs> but when I got to the aisle, I don't remember anything else, but I remember coming forward and praying. It was just all the word. People are telling me all these things. That say this, and I'm, I'm repeating this prayer. When I'm finished praying, one of the things we were always adamant about was the baptism of the Holy Ghost. When people got saved, we prayed with them to get filled with the Holy Ghost right then and there. And so I just gotten saved, and they said, listen, um, um, you need to be filled with the Holy Ghost. Do you know what that is? No, you need it. Uh, okay, uh, uh, lift your hands. They lifted my hands up uh, like four hands was on my sweaty head, uh, and they just all started speaking in tongues. And I'm like, what in the world? And one of the guys opens his eyes. He goes, speak it, speak it. Uh, uh, you know. Nothing happened. So the next service I come, and, and, and at the altar call, about four of these guys made a beeline for me. Come on, you need to feel the Holy Ghost. Uh, uh, it was no option, you know. They just kind of grabbed you, brought me forward, uh, and they prayed. Listen, this went on for weeks. It got to the point where I didn't want to come to church no more. I would come and sit in the back, uh, and as soon as altar call was over, I'd try to make an exit, uh, but sure enough, someone would stop me. Hey, hey, James, come on, come on, we're going to pray with the Holy Ghost. Listen, this went on for weeks. Uh, it turned into months, and it got to the point where I was so frustrated. Service after service after revival after revival, uh, you know, praying for the Holy Ghost, going home, praying God, fill me with the Holy Ghost, and nothing, crickets. And I remember coming to a point where saying, man, maybe it's just not for me. Two months had gone by. Listen, it, it was just agonizing. It was frustrating. It was vexing. I'd come to church. They're preaching. I'm not hearing nothing. I'm just thinking about the altar call. I'm looking around trying to find where those guys are. You know, it's a, it, it just became so overwhelming. And I want to preach a message entitled, How Long the Wait? Because <laughs> we've all been there, haven't we? Every one of us in this place this morning, we're waiting on God for something that only God can do. There are people that are upon our hearts. There's desperate needs within our lives. There's circumstances that we're facing, direction that we need. Listen, the clock is ticking and we're waiting and we're praying and we're waiting and we're praying. And the cry of all of us, God, how long the wait? Our text, Isaiah 51, verses 9 and 10 says, Wake up, wake up, O Lord. Clothe yourself with strength. Flex your mighty right arm. Rouse yourself as in the days of old when you slew Egypt, the dragon of the Nile. Are you not the same today, the one who dried up the sea, making a path of escape through the depths so that your people could cross over? Oh, how many times we prayed that prayer in our own words. God, where are you? God, I know you're the same yesterday, today, and forever. You are the same God uh, that parted the Red Sea. You're the same God that saved me and delivered me. God, wake up. Wake. Where are you? How long the wait? See, this is oftentimes the frustration of our lives. The wait, it affects our worship. 
It begins to affect our faith in God. It, it robs us of joy and victorious living. Uh, and we've all quoted the scripture, you know, in Isaiah 40, 31, they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength and mount up with wings. We know that. And we're waiting and we're trying to mount up. And we're waiting and we're trying to mount up and it's like a kite that won't get up in the air. And we wait and we ask for God to eat some more. And all the while, we grow more and more frustrated. And even we come to the point where we're willing to throw in the towel. How long the wait? See, this was the prayer of our text of scripture. Even as you read it, you can feel their anguish. Wake up, wake up, O oh Lord. Clothe yourself with strength. Flex your mighty right arm. Rouse yourself. And here are people that are in anguish and they're crying out because what they see does not line up with what they've read and what they've heard. Man, I'm reading scriptures in the Bible of a God that moves mightily. I'm reading scriptures of, of men in prison that are set free miraculously. I'm reading scriptures of, of a, a miracle working provision out of nothing. I'm reading scriptures of God raising people from the dead and causing illness to leave, depression to flee, demonic strongholds to be broken, blind eyes to be open, financial resources where there was nothing. And we read these stories and our cry is, God, wake up, please show yourself strong as you did in these stories do in my life. We appeal to the past acts of God. God, it ain't even about me, Lord. God, just be who you always have been. I'm just asking you to do what you did before. And this is why the book of Psalms is so powerful and, and most often read because, man, David just kept it real, didn't he? Man, David wrote this stuff that we think that we don't say. Huh? David in Psalms 13, how long will you forget me, Lord? Forever? My days. We wouldn't say that, but we want to. How long will you look the other way when I'm in need? How long must I uh, be in hiding daily anguish in my heart? How long shall my enemy have the upper hand? How many times we pray that? God, you see that what they're doing is wrong. They're plotting against me. God, how long will you give them the upper hand? I'm trying not to defend myself. I'm trying to wait on you. But God, where are you? Habakkuk 1, 2 says, how long, Lord, must I call for help? But you do not listen or cry out to you violence, but you do not save. See, these are times where we come to crises of faith. These are times where there's a conflict in, in what we're experiencing and what we read in our faith. We know that we serve a God, that, that the Bible says he knows our needs even before we ask. We know that we serve a God, that the Bible says that God can meet all of our needs according to his riches and glory. Listen, we understand that there's, there's no lack of provision there's no lack of power, of deliverance. God can do all things. We know that. We're saying, God, listen, I'm not even asking for all things. Just do this thing. <laughs> How long the wait? And it's in these times where if we're not careful, we begin to make life-altering decisions. Because listen, man, it's not that we don't believe God, but it's the weight that kills us. We battle doubt and despair and hopelessness. Unbelief begins to gain an advantage over us. And all the while we say, God, how long? And we pray and we wait and we pray and we wait. And people encourage us. They say, hey, I'm praying for you. We pray and wait and we pray and wait. I was just talking to a man the other day. I said, hey, how's it going? Man, it ain't even getting better. It's getting worse. What do you, I said, listen, man, hang in there. God knows. He says, I'm hanging.
Let's step back and see the big picture this morning. Because as these people are crying out to God, wake up, wake up, O Lord. God answers them in Isaiah 52, 1 and 2. Listen to what God says. Wake up, wake up, O Zion. Clothe yourself with strength. Put on your beautiful clothes, O holy city of Jerusalem, for unclean and godless people will enter your gates no longer. Rise from the dust, O Jerusalem. Sit in a place of honor. Remove the chains of slavery from your neck, O captive daughter of Zion. Wait, wait, wait. Time out. Time out. I'm confused here. I'm praying God wake up. You mean to tell me God's answer is James wake up? Not long ago, I was on a job site, and there was a GC there. He had a, and it was kind of like an off day, and he brought his daughter to work. It's like a construction site. And his daughter was young, and, and you know, I'm talking to him. He goes, hey, this is my daughter. I go, hey, how you, you know, hey, how you doing? What's your name? And she looks at me, and she goes, what's your name? I said, oh, how old are you? How old are you? I said, are you having fun? She goes, are you having fun? Now, now I'm about to like, hey, I'm going to show you some fun in a second, <laughs> right? <laughs> and he was like, don't do that. Don't do that. She's just, she's just messing with me. And it's almost like, God, are you messing with us? Wake up, wake up, oh God, show yourself strong. Wake up, wake up, put your name there, show yourself strong. Wait, time out. You're saying the same thing I'm saying. Come on, God. I'm not saying that this is always the case. But if we're honest, I believe this happens more often than we know because we see it so many times in the word of God. In 1 Samuel chapter 17, the, 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 the army of God is encamped against the Philistines. Man, the Philistines are a serious army. And every day this giant comes out in the valley, Goliath, between the two armies. And he says, hey, send me out a man to fight. And God's army, they're terrified because Goliath could break you in half and spit you out. David comes on the scene, maybe what, 11, 12 years old, just a little kid, just to see how his brothers are doing. He comes, he's standing around all these mighty warriors. He's like, man, God, how's it going? They're all chiseled. He can see the, the marks of war on them. Man, these guys are serious. Listen, their weapons are, 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 are gleaming, man, the edges of their swords. And David is like any young boy. He's impressed. And while he's watching all this, taking it all in, Goliath comes out. Send me out a man. And David looks like, who's that uncircumcised Philistine? Huh? While everyone was looking at Goliath's face, David was looking down at, wait, who's that uncircumcised Philistine? Hey, I don't know what he's looking at, but hey, who is that? And his brother said, David, just calm down. You don't know nothing about this. He goes, man, can't there be something done? Shut up, David. Man, go back to them sheep. You don't know nothing about this. This is grown man stuff. We got it a couple of minutes. We've been praying. We've been waiting. God's going to help us. Man, we've been fasting. Man, listen, you don't know nothing about this. This is spiritual. Listen, we're waiting on God. You don't even know nothing about that. And they've been waiting and praying and waiting and praying. God, awake. Show yourself strong. Deal with Goliath. And while they're praying and waiting, David gathers some rocks. Really? And he closes his eyes and throws it as hard as he can. And bam, God moves. Why? Because while they're praying, awake, O oh God. God's saying, awake, O oh men of God. And so many times in our lives, 
while we wait and wait on God, I believe in my own life there's times where God's been waiting and waiting and waiting on me. Matthew 25, 27. Listen, a one talent man, he comes to the master and the master says in verse 27, thou oughtest therefore to have put thy money to, to, to the exchangers and then at my coming I should have received mine own with usury. Take therefore the talent from him and give it unto him which hath ten talents. Listen, talents were divided amongst people. One man got one talent and his entire life he woke up and looked at that talent and man, God move Lord, show yourself strong, multiply. He wastes his entire life waiting for God to move. And you know what the master says? This is the clincher. The master comes and says, man, listen. All you had to listen. Ain't even asking you to do supernatural stuff. All you had to do was just take it to the bank. In other words, he said, listen. The least you could have done. Do you hear what God's saying? If you would have done even the least man, I would have helped you. Awake, oh God. Awake, oh James. Matthew 23, verse 37, the indictment. It says, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them that are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathered her chickens under her wings, and you would not. Do you hear what God's saying? Jesus said, listen, I would have done so much. Man, I was ready. But you wouldn't. Wait a minute. You mean to tell me that what I do can influence what God does? But God's God. He can do anything. Every service, they would come get me. And I mean, it got to the point where I'm just, they're just dragging me to the altar. I mean, I'm on my knees. They're gonna just, they're screaming, you know, and I'm like, Father, fill me with the Holy Ghost. Yeah. Come on, speak it out, speak it out. Uh, 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 that's it, that's it. Uh, uh, nothing. But let me tell you the rest of the story. God had been dealing with me about some stuff, right? Like he always does, he deals with us. And the, but these were things that were dear to my heart, and God was just prodding me. Just, James, you can lay that down. And, and you can give me your all. And I remember I was struggling, man. These are things that had identified me. This, this was my life. This was my future. And I remember I, I, I agonized so many times. If you would have come ask me, I would have known. I would have, listen, I knew exactly what God was telling me to do. It was no mystery. And I remember on a Wednesday, I don't know how, by his grace, I made some radical decisions. I altered the course of my life. And I remember I was walking back to the dorm and, and, and I was crying. God, man. It's like my whole future has gone, man. And I remember they came and picked me up for church and I was like, why not? Might as well go. They brought me to service. I'm sitting there. That night, they come get me, sure enough. We walk down to the front, and, and I lift my hands, and I said, Lord, please. Shonda instantly got filled with the Holy Ghost. Listen, man, it was no, it, no, no, it, listen, it, it was no mimic. It, listen, this was real. God filled me. I was blown away. You know, I, I, I'm opening my eyes, stuff's coming out. What in the world? And they're all overjoyed. They're hugging me and like, praise God, I got filled with the Holy Ghost. Instantly. God, how long? You know what God says? 
That's a good question because I'm asking you that. This is the mystery of the kingdom of God. Remember Jacob's dream in Genesis 28, 12. Remember Jacob left home. He's on his way to his uncle, uncle Laban's house. And, and, he, and, he, and the Bible says he, he sleeps out in the wilderness. Man, those are serious men. And the Bible says he, he had a rock for a pillow. My days. <laughs> and he laid his head on the rock. And the Bible says he had a dream. We're like, hey, if I lay my head on the rock, I'm going to have a dream too. It says he dreamed in Genesis 28, 12, and behold, a ladder set up on the earth, and the top of it reached to heaven. And behold, the angels of God ascending and descending on it. Do you see that? He's sleeping in a ladder. It's from earth all the way to heaven. And the clincher is it says the angels are ascending and descending. Wouldn't you think that the angels would be descending from heaven, coming to earth? Then going back up. He says, no, 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 no. The angels are ascending. They're originating from earth and going to heaven. Wait, wait, wait. Time out. What's that all about? Listen, what God is showing us, church, is that there's a human factor sometimes. That we can influence and initiate and be the catalyst sometimes for God doing what he wants to do. Angels are going up and then coming down instead of coming down and then going up. And we see this truth all throughout scripture. He said, listen, Peter, launch your boat out into the deep. Why? Because God wanted to bless him. Listen, Peter had been longing, God, please break through. We've been working and laboring, nothing. God, give us a breakthrough. Listen, God had that breakthrough. But before he did, he says, Peter, launch out into the deep. God could have just blinked his eyes and the boat would have been filled with fish. But you know what? If Peter would have said, no, nah, man, I ain't feeling that. Guess what? He would have went home with no fish. The water to wine. Hey, fill the water pots with water to the brim. But, but God, you're God. You can just blink your eye and the water can be changed to wine. The water pots can be filled. Yes, he is. But oftentimes, we are the catalyst. Now, I'm not saying this to say that we're, we have all this power. Listen, what I'm saying is that, listen, God intently wants to move on our behalf. And sometimes what's hindering him is not his ability. It's our willingness. It says, give and it shall be given to you. It doesn't say it shall be given to you, then you give. What is he saying? Listen, you can influence what I can do or what I want to do. He says, resist the devil and he'll flee from you. And all throughout scriptures, we see this over and over and over again. When Peter identified the Lord, he says, who do men say that I am? He says, who do you say that? He says, man, you're the Christ. I know who you are. You're the son of the living God. He says, Peter, man, hey, on this rock, I'm going to build my church. And he says these words. He goes, I'm going to give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. And whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. God again is saying, listen, our actions and our decisions can trigger something that only God can do. See, while we're praying... Wake up, wake up, O oh Lord. Show yourself strong. Be the same God you were in days old. God is saying the same thing to you. Wake up, wake up, my son or daughter. Show yourself strong. I remember years ago, we were in Baltimore, Maryland. This was probably 1987. And we had a small group of people, maybe about eight people that were coming to church. They were varied ages. And there was this older lady. She would come. She was probably in her, at the time, I would say she might have been her 58. You know, back then we thought that was old. (laughs) 
And here we are today, 60, 61, 70, my days. Yeah, we old. And so I remember every single service. You know how we used to have the, uh, 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 the prayer requests, you know, uh, and, and, and every service she would come and, and, and they would put the prayer requests on the pulpit. And, and the first prayer request, every service, please pray for my husband for salvation. And so you know what? The first couple of months, I praise God, I pray for my husband for salvation. But every service, folks, I'm like, you know, you don't even have to write it down every time. Every service for about a year. Okay, let's, let's, let's open our service in prayer. Oh, uh, uh, sometimes I want to just, let's just open in prayer. And she was like, Pastor, Pastor, uh, uh, can you pray for my husband? Yeah, yeah, all right. Yeah, let's pray for her husband, right? I mean, every service, I'm not exaggerating. I preached one time on forgiveness. And by the grace of God, she understood what I was saying because I, I didn't know what I was doing. And she comes to the altar and she responds. I remember she's, she's responding, I'm praying, and she goes, Pastor, I, I just need to forgive my husband. And I lead her in a prayer and she just begins to weep. In other words, what was happening was very deep. She goes home. That evening service, to our entire shock and amazement, she walks into church with her husband. And so we thought this guy was rough, old, hard-headed, you know, re re you know, rebellious. He walks in with her. We're all shocked. She introduces us. We meet him, and, and, and he raises his hand, gives his life to Jesus. I'm like, what in the world? You know what he said? He said, man, he goes, I was at home, and, and my wife comes in after the service this morning, and and she's a completely changed person. I said, man, I, I want to come and find this thing out. Do you hear me? For years. Wake up, wake up. Oh, God, save my husband. God said, wake up, wake up. Forgive him. And when she simply did the thing that God had been dealing with her to do, God flexed his arms and showed himself strong. My days. Listen, folks, God ain't forgotten about us. He loves us with an everlasting love. He knows exactly what you're going through and how long you've been going through it. And there are people in this place this morning, you're, you're in anguish. God, wake up. God, where are you? God, wake up. I feel like you're gone in my life. But he hasn't. And the question we need to ask ourselves is we need to just silence our heart and all the turmoil and listen. Because sometimes he's saying, wake up, wake up, put your name there. Show yourself strong. Do the thing that you feel like you can never do. God's going to help you. This is the God. God would help us do what he asks us to do. And then he'll bless us with what we can't do. I mean, he covers it all. How long the wait? Sometimes we determine that. I want you to bow your heads with me all across this place.